Um, it's a great pleasure again to introduce our final speaker of this of this session just before coffee, um, Francesco Turci from Turin. Um, Francesco has greatly appreciated to come. Um, one of Francesco's colleagues was initially due to give a talk on, on the crystalline silica, but she couldn't make it. And Francesco um, really, without any hesitation, said he would he would happily come and give this talk. So we thank you very much, Francesco, for, for making it. And I look forward to hearing about silica. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, it's really an honor to be here, just walking up the stairs and entering the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm a chemist, so it's kind of flattering. And I thank Christina for giving me the opportunity and you to give it to her, so it's a long chain of thanks. And um, yeah, uh, so with silica, I think we are concluding the big three in uh, particle toxicology today. And um, uh, what I will show you today is, uh, first of all, that we cannot make uh, a world uh, as we know it without silica. Silica is basically everywhere. Uh, as the extraction of silica is uh, a huge amount. So we're talking about 32 uh, millions of tons per year uh, worldwide. Uh, um, this is the European uh, chain value, so only Europe. And uh, uh, silica is processed in so many different ways, uh, but mainly um, the, the main products uh, that we uh, get from uh, the processing of uh, uh, minerals containing silica is quartz or crystallite at a lesser amount. But then quartz is used everywhere in every kind of product that you can find uh, in, in your home, uh, in our cities and cars. Everywhere, uh, look at just this picture that is uh, from the website savesilica.eu. Um, uh, silica is basically everywhere. And also the scientific community is dealing with that. So those are the last 30 years of scientific publication with a, a steep increasing uh, number of publication uh, on, on, on silica. So basically, uh, why uh, silica is so important for us is not like a, uh, a matter of, of uh, doubt. But with industrial importance and economic importance comes also a burden, uh, which is the fact that, as you all know, silica is a cause of uh, several respiratory diseases, severe dis respiratory disease. Currently, silica is the most significant uh, uh, cause of um, uh, occupational uh, respiratory disease worldwide with more than 10,000 cases uh, uh, death per year, uh, which uh, is reported to be a high underestimation. Um, so if we uh, go through uh, data, we see that we have today still millions of people highly exposed to silica, which is something we do not see much uh, in uh, highly industrialized countries, but it's still very, very common in, uh, in other countries where um, uh, safety measurements are not enforced at high level. So um, you, uh, we have to take into account also uh, that uh, in Europe, uh, uh, three to five uh, millions of people are potentially exposed uh, uh, to, to silica dust. But if you, we look at, at with a broader uh, view, we see that we have 11 millions in India and more than 20 millions in China. So when we come uh, uh, to today, as I said, silica is not uh, 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 very, very, um, uh, very high level of concern as is exposure in, in Europe. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we have uh, been, uh, th there has been recent reports of new outbreak uh, of silicosis that were quite surprisingly happening in uh, uh, Spain, for instance, or Italy or uh, um, Australia. Uh, if you have a look at the, the number here, on a court of only two, uh, on, on a court of uh, 200 uh, um, uh, silica workers, they were people working in uh, uh, artificial stone processing, which is a composite materials made mainly of quartz, like 85, 90% of quartz. Uh, 
the, the material is uh, uh, taken together with the binders, resins. Uh, but when the people are cutting these materials, they get exposed to a very high level of uh, silicates. Of course, they might use protections, but they, if they don't use it, they are exposed uh, to very high amount of quartz. And from 200 uh, um, uh, workers, we have uh, we uh, had a reporter in, in um, 2020 106 cases, like 80 for 48% cases of silicosis, and seven uh, uh, progressive massive fibrosis that turned out after four years into 40 cases, so heating up to a 40% of uh, uh, PMF in just for years, which is surprising. I know many of you are familiar with the long uh, time uh, required for silicosis to take, to, take, um, um, to, to develop. And similar figures, uh, not, maybe not as much uh, intense, uh, were reported for Australia. And those uh, cases were connected, uh, as I told you, on artificial stone processing. Um, Beside crystalline silica, uh, which I will explain you in a, in a minute, uh, uh, we have also new uh, sources of exposure that comes from nanoparticle development. Silica nanoparticles are the most uh, widely produced uh, nanoparticles uh, worldwide so far, and uh, uh, industrial exposure may be actual, uh, natural figures in the, in the next years. Um, um, the um, uh, role and uh, uh, chemistry of uh, silica nanoparticles is similar to uh, larger counterparts, but maybe with some differences uh, that we may look. Um, coming to the big difference between uh, crystalline and amorphous silica, uh, we can see that uh, all uh, nanoparticles are basically made of uh, amorphous silica. Uh, while uh, we know that crystalline silica is uh, the main source of quartz, uh, the, the structure, the chemical structure of these two minerals, of these two materials, uh, um, is uh, identical from the chemical point of view, but the arrangement of the atoms in the 3D structure is very different. So, in a, when you have an amorphous material, you have an unordered uh, setting uh, of uh, atoms in the space, while an ordered uh, um, lattice occurs when you uh, look at crystalline silica. This brings uh, the crystalline silica to have a much higher biopersistence, as was uh, shown for fibers, some of these uh, uh, of those uh, uh, structure activity relationship adapts also to quartz, and uh, uh, a lower uh, biopersistence seems to be the reason of the uh, transient inflammation and the uh, less extent of fibrosis that is observed for silica. Um, so coming to the toxicity of crystalline silica, it's uh, uh, north, uh, good, north, good work. It's uh, worth noting, noting that uh, since uh, 1997 has been cleared out uh, that silica uh, could be included into the carcinogenic uh, materials, but with a caveat. The caveat that the IARC introduced in the monography was about the fact that the different sources of silica were showing very different potency of inducing. Uh, lung diseases. And that uh, brought us to a very uh, important point, which is the variability of toxic responses that could be um, uh, elicited by quartz. That was uh, not surprising because uh, if we go at the atomic level, we see that uh, silica is made of silicon tetrahedra with silicon atom at the center and uh, four oxygen at the sides. But we might have a very great uh, and huge differentiation in terms of uh, uh, tridimensional uh, space occupation of this tetrahedra. That determines very different protein, uh, properties of these uh, materials. Also, for amorphous silica in more recent years, very strong differentiation uh, was observed. And uh, now we know that uh, even in the uh, realm of amorphous silica, 
we can have uh, physical chemical characteristics, uh, uh, for instance, the root of uh, synthesis, that brings very different uh, toxicological results. The, um, for instance, the pyrolytic silica nanoparticles seems to be much more reactive in terms of membranolysis, for instance, the capacity of break uh, cell membrane, than other silica, uh, like uh, mesoporous silica generated in, uh, uh, in solution. And this brings to the main question of my talk today, is uh, what are the physical chemical descript descriptors uh, that can be linked to the path path pathogenicity of silica? Well, um, to do this, as I show you, uh, we have to reduce the complexity of this huge realm of particles and materials and uh, come to something that can be um, uh, uh, imagined as a more simple uh, account. So to achieve what could be uh, the reason of the molecular initiating event of the silica, we know that macrophages are involved at the very early stages as they generate uh, a cascade of inflammatory events that deposit uh, collagen into the lungs and then you get uh, interstitial fibrosis and so on. Uh, at the cellular level, we have quartz crystals that can be uh, engulfed in lysosome, in lysosome and damage this membrane, activating the inflammasome uh, protein uh, uh, complex. The activation of the inflammasome is now reported to be the molecular initiating event of uh, the silica inflammation. Well, to understand uh, what a, how about surface chemistry is, is uh, of course, is able to uh, interact with membranes, we synthesize uh, a quartz crystal uh, that have perfect and uh, clean surfaces. These uh, surfaces uh, were tested, these uh, particles, uh, against uh, the capability to break membrane cells uh, with red blood cells. And uh, we observed that compared to a conventional quartz, uh, the synthetic quartz sharing all that share with the uh, mineral quartz, all the other characteristics, were not showing uh, capability to break membranes. But when we took these uh, little uh, quartz crystals and we grounded in a jar, we were getting the same uh, um, inflammatory effect uh, that we were observing with mineral quartz. So something that was happening on this surface, on these bro broken surfaces, was leading uh, the quartz to the possibility to break uh, crystals. Uh, we know that when quartz is broken, uh, it generates uh, conchoidal fractures, and uh, to a higher resolution, this is a TEM image, a uh, very thin, few nanometers uh, amorphous layer on top of this uh, quartz. This nano layer has been env envisaged since uh, the 1936, where there are no images at all like this, like, and it's described uh, in, as a Belby layer. If we come to our modeling, we can think uh, of this arrangement of atoms as a perfect crystal structure with silicon and oxygen bounding in the tetrahedra. When you break up, these bonds, you creating a new crystal and uh, fracturing the crystals, they promptly react with water oxygen, creating silanols or silanols, whoever, I never know how you would you pronounce that. So silanols uh, that may sit to a different distance on the surface. To make a scheme of that, we can have a very close silanols on the surface interacting one each other, and those uh, strongly interacting silanols are not very prone to interact with anything else outside. But when the silanols are a little far apart, they come to a perfect distance to interact with uh, um, uh, membrane structure of our cell membrane. In fact, with uh, infrared spectroscopy, we show that uh, when you take uh, uh, pure, intact, uh, non-ground crystals, they have surface just showing interacting silanols, and they are not able to interact with cell membrane. And so we saw in vitro and in vivo, they were not able to induce any sort of inflammation. On the other hand, when you break your crystals, you generate 
uh, disorganization of the structural order, and then you see some uh, uh, very specific distance of silanols appear instead of these nearly free silanols that we uh, uh, didn't identify with infrared spectroscopy, and then you have a membranogenic effect. Uh, we demonstrated with the ab initio, cal ab initio calculation that the distance between these two silanols is the, the exact distance uh, that is able to bind uh, a phosphate group in phospholipids. And so this is a distance that can uh, be seen as an interaction site for breaking up uh, our membranes. So to conclude, uh, we have shown uh, that uh, we cannot work, live without silica, uh, but uh, whenever you break up a uh, silica crystal, you generate nearly free silanols. And these nearly free signals uh, are very important because uh, it looks like uh, uh, they are uh, uh, they can introduce inflammatory effect, uh, a membranolytic effect on quartz. Also, on amorphous silica, we were able to observe these nearly free signals, and they were uh, linked to the inflammatory effect. That leads us uh, to think that we, with this data, we can uh, have safe by design preparation of new particles and nanoparticles that con not contain these structures and possibly they have a lower inflammation. And also, uh, it could be a nice uh, starting point for a unifying model of uh, mineral interaction with the membrane and cells uh, able to predict the inflammogenic uh, or toxic effects of also of more complex structure like silicates. So thank you so much for the attention. This is the group that has been working. Of course, Christina, that was formally invited here, and uh, all the other people that collaborated uh, in uh, the recent research uh, on silica. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Francesco. That was uh, brilliant. So. Um... It's always um, lovely to see this work. I did my PhD on silica, so it always gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling to see it again, even though it was with Vicky, and I now look like I'm 500 years older than her. I don't know what you're doing, Vicky, but yeah, and do I look at your granddad? <laughs> Must be something to do with aging and silica in there somewhere. Um, any questions for Francisco? Anthony. So clinical observations over decades have uh, shown that silicosis occurs Um, the, other, the other side of the issue is coal mine. The, there is always a relationship between coal dust, silica, and silicate. And silic silicate seem to occlude the surface of silica, which makes the salt makes silica in coal mining much coarse, much less harmful than it would be if it were not associated. Um, and I think that's a general observation that, that a lot of industries process rock which contains a lot of silicate with a certain amount of silicate. Um, does that fit with, um, with what you've been telling us about uh, using certain activation? Uh, well, we are now studying silicates, uh, as I mentioned, uh, and we have some. Uh, data on, on clay minerals, uh, uh, kaolin, basically, and uh, bentonites. Um, the nearly free sinalon model uh, appears to be relevant uh, for, some, uh, um, for some minerals, like kaolins. We were, obser we were observing, uh, we aren't talking about silanols anymore, because we have aluminum ions there that can more or less create structure with a similar uh, effect. So we saw membranolytic effect uh, uh, also with kaolins, but uh, uh, maybe it's too early to say if we have this unifying uh, um, um, approach, uh, unifying uh, observation, but um, yes, uh, 
uh, on the silica, uh, we are using industrial mined quartz and uh, uh, we do not see that uh, the industrial mined quartz that could be mixed up a little bit with uh, uh, silicates, uh, they do not show a different reactivity uh, related to the occurrence of NFS. So, so far, as long as we see the newly free silanols uh, on the silica surface, we observe uh, um, inflammogenic potential. Time for one more quote. Did anyone, someone else have their hand up? No. If not, then I'm not going to stand in your way for coffee, which is just served in the room um, straight across. Yes, thank well, thank you, so you so much again.